All right, the last few lectures today and into the next three lectures after this, we're going to be talking about the phenomenon, which is often referred to as the situation of market imperfections. And an equivalent term that often gets used in the literature and by individuals is so-called market failure. So these two terms are identical to each other in terms of what they're referring to. Okay, so let me, let me, let's give you a definition and some examples of it. So the definition is, we have been working with almost exclusively models of perfect competition. Now, I say almost exclusively because we have had some issues where, or some mar models, where we have had imperfect or uh, market imperfections incorporated, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But the standard model of supply and demand that we use in economics, it's got the underlying presumption that markets are perfectly competitive. And that incorporates a whole set of conditions, assumptions that are thrown in that, that both make the model easier to work with, but also kind of make the economy and the way it works as perfect as possible. Now, we are aware in economics that the world is really not perfectly competitive. In most respects, it's not, it, it, could, it comes close to that in some instances, but for many, many different reasons, markets are not strictly 100% or probably even 90% perfectly competitive, all right? And so a lot of the action of understanding the real world economy corresponds to understanding when and how the world deviates away from this sort of standard model of perfect competition. Now, the perfect competition model, as I mentioned before, serves a useful purpose, even though it is an unrealistic presentation or example of how the world works. And the reason it serves as a good model is because it actually gives us the ability to compare, to kind of look at when markets fail or when markets are imperfect, how does that compare with the situation that would occur if markets were perfectly competitive? So it's kind of like, I, I used the term, and an economist some time ago used this term, and I like it. They sometimes call perfect competition economic nirvana. You know, and nirvana is this state of realization, of, of understanding the world and understanding everything. It's where the Buddha in Buddhism is trying to achieve, reach nirvana and you've got full enlightenment and full understanding of the world and your position and place in it. Okay, and perfect competition is kind of like that. It's this, it's this aspiration, this thing we're trying to achieve or wish we could achieve, but we know that we're human and we just are never gonna be able to quite get there. But we can still view it, we can still understand what it would look like and we could aspire to try to get as close to that economic nirvana, that perfect competition as possible. And the perfect competition model offers us that sort of enlightened world that, that's out there that we're never really gonna reach, but which we'd like to aspire to, okay? Now, the real world, however, is not perfectly competitive. It is riddled with so-called market imperfections or market failures. And we also need to understand how the world works and how the market fails, if you will, when, when things are not perfectly competitive. Okay, so what are the examples? The most important examples, first up, are some we've already considered. What if you've got a monopoly in a market? You don't have competing firms trying to supply a particular product to a market. What if you've got a small number of firms with market and price setting power? So what if you have a monopoly and oligopoly? Well, the analysis is different. And what we saw in those particular cases is that the world works a little bit less well. When you have a monopoly, a monopolist will, relative to perfect competition, cut back output, raise up the price, increase their profitability on their own benefits, but at the expense of the larger whole. More people will be hurt or injured as a result of that behavior, and it results in a reduction in market efficiency things work worse, the market fails, in other words, when you incorporate monopoly or oligopoly into the model. Same thing is true on the other side. If you've got a monopsony, a monopsony firm can lower wages and exploit its workers to a high degree and a high capacity, reducing the benefits to workers in order to benefit their bottom line and to increase their profitability. So to the extent that a monopsony exists, the market fails. It doesn't work as well as it would have. 
and we end up with a less efficient outcome because of the presence of monopsony or oligopsony. Now, today, next, we're going to talk about public goods. Public goods are another place where the market doesn't work perfectly to provide for public goods, and I'm going to give you a definition of what that means. But this public goods argument becomes one of the really strong arguments in support of government intervention in the economic system. I'm going to highlight that in a minute or two. Over the course of the next few lectures, we're going to talk about externality effects and common resources. And those are going to be additional reasons why markets can fail, cannot quite work perfectly, and generate outcomes that are not the best for everybody. We're also, whenever we introduce imperfections or market failures, we're also introducing an argument for government to come in and help correct for these particular problems, to improve the market through its intervention. And so we're going to give a series of arguments where the presence of government can actually make the economic system work more effectively. And this becomes the really strong argument in support of a government to rule over and to monitor and to improve economic outcomes or the economic system. All right, now, there's some other arguments here with imperfect information, and we've already considered that to one degree when we talked about Smith and Jones coming to the market and not having perfect information about the products they're receiving opens up the door for deception to take place. And to the extent that deception occurs, we said we're not going to get a good outcome where everybody wins. And so the market becomes inefficient in the presence of imperfect information that leads to deceptive behavior. We already saw that. So we've done a little bit of analysis with market imperfections in place. But now we're just going to regularize this. We're going to put this into this context so that we can understand how these different elements kind of fit together. Now, before I go on, I do want to highlight that I'm a little bit troubled by the use of the term economic failures. And the reason for that is because the market doesn't really fail in the sense that it doesn't work at all. Instead, the market just changes its outcome. We get different prices, different quantities, different returns, profits, and so forth when we have imperfections in place. The market doesn't stop working or functioning. So the term failure is really a failure relative to the perfectly competitive outcome that could occur. 